class. How you doing? Little Tommy coming at you. The Orange Homeschooling Mug. Volume 59. 1959. The Golden Era for Kalamazoo. Hope you guys are good. Um, hope you're having a good week. I'm in a pretty good place. I Man, I had a this Monday and Tuesday this week. I was recording on that, uh, working on that Dean DeLeo project that we're doing. Man, a little record we're making, and it is fun. I'm having a blast. Um, you know, I was telling a couple of friends it's a very cathartic, uh, enjoyable experience to actually be in the studio working on some music that's not for somebody else. It only took me 51 years to figure this out, kids. Uncle Larry is a late bloomer. I think that's the moral of that story. Um, we got some good stuff. Oh, I wanted to say thanks to Dirk, my friend, for this cool, crazy shirt. Patent applied for. My favorite pickups. Thanks, Dirk. That was cool, man. Send that. Um, I got some really hot stuff in the viewer comment bin for you. Um, one guy said, hey, Tom, is the garage classroom air conditioned? Well, yes. The first thing I did when the summer started rolling around was go have get an air conditioner and have my friend Brian put it in for me because, uh, Lord, it gets hot here. Lord, Jesus. You don't ever want to come visit Nashville in June, July, or August, people. It's like a jungle. Uh, 100 degrees, you know, 100% humidity. It's terrible. I mean, the fall is what I live for, as I've said many times. I can't wait fall. Fall is beautiful here. Uh, but, man, these summers are rough. Oh, Lord, you got to have that air conditioner. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be able to be out here. There's no way. Um, another guy said, uh, hey, Uncle Larry, have you ever played any pedal steel? Oh, yeah. I think uh, every lifelong guitar player inevitably goes to that phase where they think they want to play pedal steel. You know, um, it's so tempting when you look over at a guy messing with one of those things, you know, you think, oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to try that at least. And uh, it happened to me about 10 years ago or so, probably. I I finally broke down and got one. I bought an old Showbud. And I remember I had my friend uh, Danny Dugmore, legendary steel player, come over and, uh, you know, t show me how to set it up and get me started. I remember I was just sitting there with an acoustic playing two chords back and forth. And I said, Danny, just play some riffs. And when I hear one I like, I'll stop and you can teach it to me. That was fun. But yeah, um, you know, I did it for a while and I, I eventually gave up on it and sold it. It's too hard. I mean, that's a life's work there, kids. You know, 10 strings and the tuning is very weird, you know, from the low to high on an E9. It's like... <laughs> The last two strings go back down. It's it's weird. It's very strange. Very very hard to play, but it's fun to try. And I, I did learn a lot messing with it. Um, another guy said, "Hey Tom, how about some wah wah pedal?" You know, I love wah wah pedal when when other people do it, but I hardly ever do it myself. I don't know why. I just have never been much of a wah guy. I mean, I love it when I hear it on records and stuff when it's done right, like the solo from. Pets by Porno for Pyros is one of my favorite wah moments. But I remember, you know, when you see a guy doing, you know, it really knows how to work a wah pedal. It's a thing of beauty. I remember years ago when we were doing that Trigger Hippie tour, um, J.D. Simo came out and opened for us a couple shows back in his uh, 59 Flame Top and 100 Watt Marshall phase. And uh, man, that boy knows how to work a wah pedal. He was killing me with that thing. But you know, I've I've tried a million different wads and I, I swear I've never found one I really loved. I don't know what it is. I just could never find one that that does it for me. I don't know. Um I don't know. What's a really great wah pedal? I don't know. Something that sounds amazing. I tried everything. I don't know. So anyway, okay, guys said uh hey Tom, can you show us an example of a way to play rhythm guitar that complements a singer like you always talk about? Um, okay. That's a that's a multifaceted question, and I could go off forever talking about that. But I'll just I'll just mention some of the high points. Okay, whether you're playing acoustic accompaniment like in a duo with a singer, 
or if you're playing electric guitar in a band with a singer, one thing you have to always be aware of is where they are range-wise with their notes. You don't ever want to be playing stuff on a guitar that's interfering with the vocal range. Um, that's why I've got the vocal cranked in my phones all the time, and I'm always listening very carefully to what they're doing because you've got to find your own place, you know, note range-wise. It's not interfering with the vocal. And you also have to be aware of where all the other musicians are range-wise, too, so you can find your own place amongst all that. That's very important. And, um, you know, when you're playing like an acoustic and a duo gig with a singer, try to imagine that you are the singer and listen to them very carefully, like when they slow down, take a pause, be right there with them. Notice where they are range-wise. When they get soft, you be soft. When they get loud, you, you give them support. It's, you know, I try to imagine in a situation like that, like I'm the singer and I try to be outside of myself imagining like what I wished a guy would play along with my singing. You know, oh, I actually, that whole outside myself thing, I do that a lot. I always try to play like a producer, you know, like I'm on the other side of the glass watching myself play and I try to play the stuff that I wish, if I was the producer, that I wish that guy would play. It's a weird little thing I do. I don't know, I've always done that. Um, I don't know, I, I try to think like a producer and not like a guitar player. That's what, I've, that's what I've always done. Okay, so more stuff. Let's see, we got, uh, that was just a very short answer on that. I could go off forever on that, but you know, just listening to the singer is really the key there. Um, another guy said, uh, uh, hey Tom, what do you think about all the cardboard cutouts in the stands at modern day sporting events? Oh man. How weird is that? That might be the single weirdest thing about this whole COVID thing. I mean, imagine what that's going to look like in history books 50 years from now when we look back at the cardboard cutouts in baseball games. Wow. Pretty weird. Okay, um, another guy said, oh, in response to that, the last video I put up where I played that wacky blues thing with the 12 string and all that, and a guy said, hey, Tom, this is probably my favorite intro so far. I've always loved blues with weird time signatures. Yeah, I'm getting a little outside with some of these, um, even that thing I just did, sort of my experimental phase I'm going through, exploratory. Like if you thought of like the arc of the home school in the show, like my early stuff was sort of like my Ziggy Stardust. Now I moved on into my sort of man who sold the world, lodger, low period. Think of it that way. Don't worry, man. I'll bring it back around to some easily accessible pop music for you. Um, okay, guitar lesson. Let's get to that. This crazy loop I was playing it really is just only a demonstration of like tonal shading on a guitar. Okay, now I always talk about tonal shading using fingers and picks like a giant tone control. Um, when you th any guitar can give you a really wide ra a range of array of, of tones, especially a Stratocaster. A Stratocaster is a really wide paintbrush. I mean, you could play with the pick and the point way down by the bridge and get that real bright, stinging, creepy thing like. <laughs> warm sound even on the bridge pickup and then you can be like you get super buttery on the neck pickup with the round part of the pick you know to the sting. See, people, somebody asked me on a session yesterday if I always play with my fingers, and uh, I said I could, I could never do that because I need to have the pick too for those moments when I want that really, really bright stinging sound. You know, um, I'll play a whole song with my fingers sometimes, but, but I still have that pick there in case I need it, right? It's just part of the arsenal of, of tone, right? You got to have that. Um, 
There was a little part in that loop that was a little weird. Um, it was like a counterpoint bit where one the one part goes up and the other one goes down. It's G minor. Okay, so I'll show you that. It's um, G minor, D7 over F sharp, B flat over F, C dominant nine over E. That's a really cool voicing of an E flat major seven. Four middle strings, right? You got E flat or B flat, E flat, open G, and D. some of this. This is one of my favorite old tricks. Uh, B flat over C. And then A minor over C. That's a cool voicing, right? Just A, C, and E all over C. Seventeen minutes. I better go. See you guys.